the Bible to the cross from the cross. Every Bible story has three components. First, God's love. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. The Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Day 182, Isaiah 21 to 24. Warning about the fantastic valley Jerusalem. God's declaration of judgment to everyone without exception stressed that it was God that the people of South Judah should rely on. First point, Isaiah continued to speak about the fall of the surrounding countries near South Judah. The fall of the Babylonian Empire was prophesied to Isaiah again in chapter 13. The Bible referred to the Babylonian Empire as a desert by the sea. During the time, a proclamation that Babylon would fall was unthinkable. But not only was this proclaimed once but twice, God told this to Isaiah even before the fall of Assyria. And this truly showed that God's management of the world was by using such empires as his tools. Later on, we see that Babylon did indeed fall in 539 BC. In the hands of Cyrus II of Persia, as proclaimed by God, the reason Babylon fell was because Midi that had the casting boat at the time prayed a law in the fall of the Assyrian Empire this time but then made an alliance with Elam to attack Babylon at a later stage. But Elam later came to be governed by Persia as well. The capital of Elam was Susan, and this place later became the geographical background of Esther. Now God proclaimed the judgment on Duma through Isaiah. Duma referred to the descendants of Edom. The Edomites lived in Seir and became a great nation. Due to their geographical location, they were able to prosper through trade. Whilst proclaiming judgment on Edom, Isaiah compared morning to night. As morning came and night came, they would experience the darkness of night. He warned that although they would wait for the morning to come, they would soon face night again. After the prophecy on Babylon and Duma, God went on to proclaim judgment on Arabia. Second point, the prophecy about the valley of the vision was God's warning to Jerusalem. After proclaiming judgment on the surrounding countries of South Judah, God continued to give a prophecy about the valley of the vision as a warning. The valley of the vision here symbolized Jerusalem. This was therefore a warning against Jerusalem. The reason Jerusalem was to be punished by God was because they did not listen to God's warning or keep to his laws and only relied on help from other countries. Therefore, God rebuked the king of South Judah for being self-reliant. Although South Judah was once on the same boat as Assyria, now the tables had turned and Assyria came to attack Jerusalem. With this, Hezekiah was making plans to salvage the situation through political strategies. The reason Jerusalem was to be punished was because they refused to admit their faults and repent. Third point, God rebuked the early leaders of South Judah. This is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says. Go, say to this steward, to Shebna, the palace administrator. Shebna was the palace administrator during the times of King Hezekiah. The next after Shebna was Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and he became the next palace administrator. Both these people had an enormous amount of power and authority. When Senna Cherubim's soldiers seized Jerusalem, these two were sent outside the Jerusalem walls to pass on Hezekiah's message. 
God rebuked the sins of Shebuna and Eliakim through Isaiah. God rebuked Shebuna's lavish and luxurious lifestyle. He abused his powers in order to read a lavish lifestyle. Such a person was not suitable to be in a responsible position. God claimed that Shebuna was a disgrace to his master. God claimed that Eliakim would take over the place of Shebna, but God knew that Eliakim would not be much better. But Isaiah claimed that all things would happen on that day, which meant that the time had not yet come. Unfortunately, Eliakim also followed in the ways of Shebna, and so God proclaimed judgment on both of them. Fourth point. God proclaimed the fall of Tyre. Now, God proclaimed judgment on Tyre. Tyre was located on an island, and they believed that they were geographically secure and safe. From living in the sea, the people of Tyre knew a lot about trade through sea. They believed themselves to be kings of the sea and were very arrogant. God's judgment on Tyre was fulfilled after the reign of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Much like South Judah, Tyre also had a difficult time for 70 years and then became completely destroyed by Alexander of the Hellenistic Empire. When Tyre became restored with the help of the Persian Empire, they provided some aid to the Jews, who were also had at work for restoration. But when they sold and traded, even during Sabbath, Nehemiah rebuked them. The reason Tyre fell completely in the hands of the Hellenistic Empire was because of their arrogance. Tyre believed that they controlled the sea, but there was something they did not know. They were not the ones to govern the sea, but the sea was protecting them from danger. Even if they had the skills to make boats, and to fight on water, if the sea did not cooperate, then all their efforts would have equated to nothing. They did not know that all their abundance could be taken away from them in one short moment. They did not know that their world was managed by God. Fifth point, no country including South Judah can be excused from God's judgment. God now came to his conclusion regarding the countries and their punishment. No country could be excused from God's judgment. No matter who you are or where you are from, no one can escape God's trial. But even in God's trial, there were those who remained. During God's trial, all the wicked would perish. Day 183 Isaiah 25 to 29. Isaiah's prayer. God proclaimed salvation from where South Judah had given up hope, despite his disappointment in them. First point. Isaiah prayed to God. Isaiah, who proclaimed judgment and the countries surrounding South Judah, prayed to God. Isaiah prayed to God as David did for his righteousness. God became the shelter, refuge, and log to the righteous. As God had protected the people of Israel after Exodus and gave them full protection in the desert, God had likewise protected the people of South Judah. Isaiah could not help praising God. When God heard Isaiah's praise, God showed him the feast in heaven for those who would be saved. This feast would be for all people in all nations who believed in God. Isaiah praised God for his mercy and love. In that day, they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The hand of the Lord will last on this mountain. But Moab will be trampled in their land, as straw is trampled down in the manure. Second point, someone who is right-minded has chances of salvation. 
to God who promised the salvation Isaiah sang, In that day this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation, its walls and rampart. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter, the nation that keeps faith. Isaiah sang of God's great kingdom. This song would later be sung by the people of South Judah who would return to Jerusalem. Isaiah therefore waited for God's salvation for the people. During God's trial, the wicked would not be forgiven and instead perish. Those who would be saved would have to endure for a while, much like Noah, who endured the flood in the ark. Third point, God proclaimed that those who were scattered would return to God and praise Him. Isaiah's song continued, In that day, the Lord will punish with His sword. His fierce, great, and powerful sword, Leviathan the gliding serpent, Leviathan the calling serpent, He will slay the monster of the sea. In that day, sing about a fruitful vineyard. Isaiah also sang of God who governed the vineyard. I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. In Isaiah chapter 5, God had waited for the people to be like good fruit, but then rebuked them for turning out bad. But now, in Isaiah chapter 27, God once again showed his mercy and love. Isaiah claimed that although God punished the North Israel and South Judah with Assyria, the people were still God's people, whom he loved dearly. Isaiah sang of the day that all his people would come forward to praise him. And in that day, a great trumpet will sound. Those who were perishing in Assyria and those who were exiled in Egypt will come and worship the Lord and the holy mountain in Jerusalem. All in all, this was a prophecy of the restored Jerusalem and the Jerusalem temple. Fourth point, God used the metaphor of a farmer to speak about salvation for his people. God, who expressed himself as a farmer, saves his people. God, the farmer, selected his people and then gave them good land. He then gave each of his people a way to live according to their characteristics. He also taught and trained them the way each grain is cultivated in different ways. God also ensured that they were saved. Fifth point, God rebuked South Judah for their wrongs and also for wanting to make an alliance with Egypt. God through Isaiah said, O to you, Ariel, Ariel, the city where David settled. Add year to year and let your cycle of festivals go on. This was God's warning of Jerusalem's fall. But God said that he would deliver South Judah from Assyria. As God said, 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers died that night. Although God protected the descendants of Abraham, they were rebuked for serving God only on the surface. South Judah committed sin and they failed to rely on God. They relied on Egypt and wanted to make an alliance with them which God rebuked. South Judah did not listen to Isaiah and God claimed that the countries which South Judah believed to be strong would face Lyric. But God added his message of restoration for them. This predicted the coming of the Messiah. Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. God told through Isaiah of the blessing the Lamnons would receive on his day of restoration. When they see among them their children the work of my hands, they will keep my name holy. They will acknowledge the holiness of the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. Day 184 
Isaiah 32-35 About the South Judah and Egypt's alliance For the restoration of Israel, God prepared a king who would rule mankind righteously and judge justly. First point, despite Isaiah's naked performance for three years, King Hezekiah still made the alliance with Egypt. Despite Isaiah's performance for three years, Hezekiah still went ahead and made the alliance with Egypt. At this, God told Hezekiah what a pointless thing he did. Who go down to Egypt without consulting me? Who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge? But Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. To Egypt, whose help is utterly useless. Therefore, I call her Lehab, the do-nothing. Even after hearing this, the people of South Judah ignored God's warning. Therefore, God told Isaiah the punishment South Judah would receive. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will all flee away, till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. This punishment was recorded in Leviticus and it was the opposite root to God's blessing. If South Judah kept to a kingdom of priests, they would have experienced God's blessing. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers and I will keep my covenant with you. However, South Judah failed to believe God's covenant and also the promises God gave them if they kept the laws of the kingdom of priests. Despite this, God still planned their restoration after their punishment. Hearing this, Isaiah's heart became overwhelmed by God's mercy and love. As such, God is always ready to forgive those who repent and come to Him. He, moreover, is willing to guide them. God told the people how they could repent and return to Him. And now God told Isaiah how the Assyrian Empire was to fall. The concept of Assyria falling was celebratory news for most of the surrounding countries. This was because Assyria had conquered, invaded, and attacked so many of their surrounding countries. Next, in Isaiah chapter 31, God's rebuke of South Judah continued. The first concerned their alliance with Egypt. Something similar had happened in the days of Solomon. Next, God told them that he would restore them once the time came. God waited for their repentance. God told them that the fall of Assyria was God's decision. Second point, Isaiah eventually spoke of the restored land through the Messiah. God told Isaiah of the fall of Assyria. And then he went on to speak about the coming of the Messiah. See, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. When the Messiah came, the following blessings would come true. First, each one will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm. Second, it will be like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great law in a thirsty land. Third, the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who hear will listen. Both the fearful heart will know and understand, and the stammering tongue will be front and clear. Fifth, the fool will no longer be called noble, and the scoundrel will not be highly praised. God told Isaiah of the trial of the people. In Isaiah chapter 3, God rebuked the nobles of South Judah 
who lived lavish lives. But now in Isaiah chapter 31, God warned the women of Jerusalem and their attitudes. God went again to speak about the coming of the Messiah, till the Spirit is poured on us from on high, and the desert becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field seems like a forest. The Lord's justice will dwell in the desert. His righteousness live in the fertile field. The fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. This concerned the return of the captives from Babylon and the restoration of the kingdom of priests, and then the coming of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Isaiah spoke of the Messiah who would bring justice and righteousness. Thus, the people were to turn to God rather than relying on Egypt or Assyria. Third point, Isaiah prayed to God to save the people of a kingdom of priests. Isaiah cried to God for grace. Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength every morning, our salvation in time of distress. Although Isaiah lamented about the people not listening to God, he nevertheless pleaded to God to save the people from Assyria. It appeared that Isaiah was proclaiming judgment on his own people, as if he was anti-South Judah, but his proclamation was his expression of love towards his country. He truly wanted his people to turn to a kingdom of priests. Isaiah spoke of how God would save South Judah eventually. The peoples will be burned to ashes like cut thorn bushes. They will be set ablaze. You who are far away, hear what I have done. You who are near, acknowledge my power. Isaiah then sang of God's restoration and of God's peace. Fourth point, God proclaimed punishment on Edom, who did not help in saving their brother nation, South Judah. Through Isaiah, God proclaimed judgment upon the wicked. God furthermore added his judgment on Edom, who were evil in God's eyes. God claimed that he would not forget that Edom turned their eye when their brother nation, South Judah, was facing hardship. During Exodus and also during the days of King Ahaz, Edom did not care to look after their brother nation. Thus, God proclaimed punishment on them. The descendants of Edom resided in Petra, and it was accessible via a narrow canyon, making it impenetrable. But God proclaimed that Petra would fall and that the place would become full of wild animals. God told through Isaiah that everything he says will come true. Fifth point, Isaiah sang of the kingdom of God which had everlasting peace. From Isaiah chapters 1 to 35, God's message was that he would judge all nations and that he wished to restore South Judah through a kingdom of priests. Isaiah used these words to console South Judah. He furthermore convinced the people that the day of salvation would come. We can see something similar when St. John tried to convince the people to persevere through dark times in Revelation. Isaiah went on to talk about God's glory. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Isaiah then sang praises to God for his salvation. Moreover, Isaiah sang of the everlasting peace in the kingdom of God. Similar content can be found in Revelation. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. 
there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Day 185, 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 13 to 37, and Isaiah 36. Hezekiah in the bird cage. When the field command of the Assyrian army, who surrounded Jerusalem with his troops, blasphemed God, Hezekiah was determined to trust God only. First point, the prophets proclaimed that South Judah would not be able to maintain a kingdom of priests if they made alliances with their surrounding countries. North Israel and South Judah made numerous alliances with their surrounding countries. First, North Israel's king Menahem made an alliance with Assyria in order to strengthen his own military power. Later, North Israel's king Pekah made an alliance with Aram's king Rezin. South Judah was also offered to join the alliance against Assyria. When South Judah refused, North Israel and Aram attacked South Judah and this led to Assyria attacking North Israel and Aram. As for South Judah, King Ahaz made an alliance with Assyria. This was in order to make protection against Aram and North Israel. Later, King Hezekiah made an alliance with Egypt. This, however, provided Assyria with the justification to invade South Judah. Second point, when Sennacherib of Assyria attacked the first time round, Hezekiah scraped the gold from the Jerusalem temple and offered it as a tribute. King Sennacherib of Assyria, who conquered North Israel and Aram, finally revealed his claws and came to attack South Judah. During the sixth year of Hezekiah's reign in South Judah, Assyria struck down North Israel. The Assyrian Empire ignored the alliance they had made with King Ahaz, and during the fourteenth year of Hezekiah, they came to South Judah and took more than 200,000 people as their captives and conquered 46 of their cities. Now one remained was the Jerusalem Temple. King Sennacherib made the following request. So Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lakish. I have done wrong. Withdraw from me, and I will pay whatever you demand of me. The king of Assyria exacted from Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Previously, Hezekiah made an alliance in order to prepare for Assyria's attack. Despite Isaiah's warning, Hezekiah wavered between anti-Assyria and pro-Egypt. This proved to have been pointless. When things started to look like a dead end, Hezekiah followed in his father Ahaz's footsteps. The first was to write a pitiful letter to the Assyrian king. The second was to offer gold and silver that was stored in the palace. But Hezekiah was unable to make 30 pieces of gold that he had to scrape gold from the Jerusalem temple. We can see just how bad the financial situation was during this time. We can see this all the more if we compare it to David's day. David gave Solomon a million pieces of silver and 100,000 pieces of gold to prepare for the temple. He furthermore offered 3,000 pieces of gold to God for the temple, and his people offered a further 5,000 pieces of gold. Thus, the Jerusalem temple at this time was dripping in gold. But all this gold had gone after 200 years, and now it was harder to make 30 pieces. Third point, despite receiving the gold, 
from the Jerusalem temple, Senna Cherib nevertheless attacked Jerusalem the way he attacked Samaria. Despite receiving the gold, the Assyrian king still sent 185,000 men to Jerusalem and started to attack. Assyria, who had used three years to conquer North Israel, wanted to speed things up. And so they sent their most able commander of the field. This man was a linguist who knew how to speak Assyrian, Aram, and also the language of South Judah. He started to lure the people of South Judah into surrendering. First point, Sennacherib's field commander rebuked God despite having no knowledge about God. The commander of the field of the Assyrian army not only mocked the people of South Judah, but also God. He publicly ridiculed Hezekiah's religious reformation and used the universal language at the time to cause chaos. When the people of South Judah understood, they proposed a conversation. But the field commander started to mock God even further. His words were indeed disgusting. Clearly, he had no idea that some time ago, God had sent Jonah to Nineveh in order to save them. He knew nothing about the history of his own country, but with his stupid words, he tried to create chaos. The Assyrian Empire believed that they could blur the boundaries of the countries and make it theirs. They did not believe that all boundaries were God's. God used Assyria as a tool for his management of the world, and God was not about to hand South Judah to them. Assyria was too arrogant to know this. Fifth point, Hezekiah commanded all to be silent in response to Assyria's field commander's rebuke. When the field commander's words continued, Hezekiah told his people to ignore him. However, he himself had a hard time swallowing this, and so he started to head somewhere. He finally made way into the temple and decided to ask God. The content of 2 Kings chapter 18 verses 13 to 20 to chapter 19 is similar to Isaiah chapters 36 to 39. The small difference is in Isaiah chapter 38 that records Hezekiah's prayer. Two Chronicles records a brief summary of this event. Thus, it is easier to read the history books and the prophet books in chronological order and through tone. Day 186, to Kings 19 and Isaiah 37. Hezekiah, victory in the temple. God heard Hezekiah's prayer that finally looked to God for deliverance, which saved Jerusalem from a great crisis. First point, 2 Kings chapter 19 and Isaiah chapter 37 are the same record of the same period. The records in 2 Kings chapter 19 and Isaiah 37 contain the same content and are based on the same historical period and therefore, it is beneficial to read these two together in context. When Hezekiah faced extreme national threat, he finally decided to go to God's temple, and this record can be found in the two books. Second point, Hezekiah eventually found out about the truth behind imperialism and chose a kingdom of priests whilst risking his life. Isaiah ministered from the reign of Ahaz to Hezekiah, and he continuously proclaimed South Judah to stop relying on the power of empires and to turn to a kingdom of priests. Ahaz, however, did not get this and thus relied on empires until the end. But Hezekiah now turned to God and prayed for his help. Hezekiah managed to make a good choice at last. Hezekiah was now prepared to listen to Isaiah. God said the following to Isaiah, 
they told him, This is what Hezekiah says. This day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace. And when children come to the moment of birth, and there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God, and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore pray for the remnant that still survives. Later on, as predicted by Isaiah, the Assyrian king died due to internal conflict. Third point, when Sennacherib of Assyria threatened the final attack, Hezekiah did not go outside to surrender but went into the Jerusalem temple to pray. The Assyrian king sent his final notification to Hezekiah. However, despite hearing this, Hezekiah did not go outside the palace walls to surrender, but later headed for the Jerusalem temple to seek God's help. Although his father Ahaz left behind an embarrassing record of a letter he sent to the Assyrian king, Hezekiah managed to leave behind a prayer passage. Fourth point, God heard Hezekiah's prayer and responded through Isaiah. God heard Hezekiah's prayer. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have heard your prayer concerning Senna Cherib, king of Assyria. God's response was that he would judge Assyria. Because you rage against me and because your insolence has reached my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my beat in your mouth, and I will make you return by the way you came. God also spoke of the restoration of South Judah. The reason God had protected the Jerusalem temple until now was due to his promise with David. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Fifth point, the death of 185,000 Assyrian soldiers is recorded both in the Bible and Herodotus' histories. God's judgment on Assyria as recorded in Isaiah now came into full force. First, Assyria failed in conquering the Jerusalem temple. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. The Bible records that the Lord's angel struck 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. In Paul Johnson's book, he reported to Herodotus' histories to come to the conclusion that pestis was the reason behind this incident. Josephus, a historian who focused on Jewish history, also wrote that Lech came and killed all these people overnight. Next, when the Assyrian king returned home, he was killed by his sons, with the deaths of 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, and with the king of Assyria being killed by his own son. The Assyrian military power started to rapidly decline. Day 187 to Kings 20 and Isaiah 38 to 39. Hezekiah restored from his disease. Although Hezekiah enjoyed the grace of his life being extended through an honest prayer, he posted himself to the messengers of Babylon who came to him. First point, Hezekiah prayed once for the salvation of the country, and second, for his illness to be cured. After beating Assyria, Hezekiah prayed to God to cure his illness. He prayed to God to remember the righteous things he did, 
during his lifetime. This was the evaluation of Hezekiah. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commandments the Lord had given Moses. Josephus writes that the reason Hezekiah prayed so desperately to be cured was not so much for his own life, but because he did not have an heir. God heard Hezekiah's prayer. Hezekiah became cured, and he was given an additional 15 years to live. Three years later, he was given a son, whom he named Manasseh. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. His mother's name was Hepzibah. Second point, Ahaz did not seek for an omen, but Hezekiah searched for an omen. The reason Ahaz did not listen to Isaiah right until the end was not because he was trusting in God, but because he was too arrogant and foolish to listen to God's words. Hezekiah was different to his father in that he had the heart to turn to God. Therefore, God gave Hezekiah a miracle as a symbol. This was similar to God's miracle during Joshua's time when the sun stopped during war. As Hezekiah obeyed, God listened to his prayer and extended his life for 15 years. Hezekiah therefore praised God. Third point, Hezekiah was humble in front of God when he received the letter from the Assyrian king, but he became arrogant after receiving a letter and gifts from the Babylonian king. When the Assyrian king sent his final notification to Hezekiah, he was humble before God. But when he received the letter and gifts from the king of Babylon, he became arrogant. The Babylon king sent envoys to South Judah to deliver the letter and gifts. At this, Hezekiah was very pleased. At the time, Babylon was becoming a powerful country. Babylon became so powerful that they traded with Egypt and stood the chance of winning against Assyria. Although Babylon was officially under the protection of Assyria during the days of Hezekiah, they were building their own forces to defeat Assyria and rule above them. Thus, Babylon was not a country that tried to collaborate with the South Judah. But Hezekiah did not know the motivations of the Babylonian king and exposed all of South Judah's warehouses. This provided the main source for Babylon when they later invaded South Judah. Fourth point, King David praised God after receiving gifts from Hiram, the king of Tyre. And King Hezekiah boasted of himself when he received the gifts from Babylon. When David received the gifts from King Hiram of Tyre, he praised God. But different to David, Hezekiah became arrogant after receiving gifts from Babylon. Hezekiah was cured from his illness as God had permitted this. And he was also able to grow prosperous thanks to God. But Hezekiah wanted to boast that it was his greatness that defeated Assyria to Babylon. The Bible recorded Hezekiah to have been arrogant. God had sent the Babylonian envoys to Hezekiah in order to test his heart. Unfortunately, Hezekiah failed this test. Fifth point, through his conversation with Isaiah, Hezekiah realized his sins. In the past, those Israel's Ahab failed to recognize his sins even after being told what they were by Elijah. However, differently to Ahab, Hezekiah recognized and admitted his sins when he was told by Isaiah. God told Hezekiah how he was to be responsible for his sins through Isaiah. What Hezekiah showed to the envoys of Babylon 
would all be taken to Babylon, and some of his descendants would serve as servants in Babylon. When Hezekiah heard this, he accepted it. He was relieved that this would not happen during his lifetime. This was irresponsible of him. Day 188, Isaiah 40-42 Isaiah's Prediction of John the Baptist Only God, who called Abraham his friend and chose Jacob, could save those in South Judah who lived without hope. First point, Isaiah made a prophecy about John the Baptist, who would come in the future. Through Isaiah, God explained how the people of South Judah who were to be taken to Babylon as captives would return. This was God's pre-telling his people of their salvation. Although the people of South Judah were to be punished for their sins, they were nevertheless still regarded as God's people. But furthermore told them of the coming of John the Baptist. Later on, in the full Gospels, the writers reported to Isaiah's records to introduce John the Baptist. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. In prophesying about sending John the Baptist, God teaches us the truth about finite life. The grass with us and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass with us, and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Later, Peter uses this in his letter. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass with us, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Second point, Isaiah cried to the people of South Judah to look to God only. Through Isaiah, God taught the people of his enormous power. Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor is animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. God rebuked the people for worshiping idols rather than their Creator. Isaiah proclaimed to the people to only follow God, and that all those who turned to him would be given new strength. Third point, God called Abraham his friend through Isaiah. God told Isaiah of the long future ahead, and this involved the fall of Babylonian Empire via Cyrus II of Persia. Only God could proclaim such plans. God explained that the Persian Empire would destroy the Babylonian Empire and that the whole world would come to fear the Persian Empire. But God told his people not to be afraid as they were always under his protection. To his people with whom he made his covenant, he called them, My servant Abraham, Jacob, and also my friend Abraham. This was to tell them not to be afraid, even when they were taken as captives to Babylon. Fourth point, through the book of Isaiah, we can fathom that the Bible is one story about Jesus Christ. The Bible is one story of Jesus, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
all the books of the prophets have their unique message and also all point in one direction. All the records of Jesus in the Bible have their foundation in Moses' writing as well as reference to the prophets. Thus, the books of the prophets are prerequisites in reading the four Gospels. Jesus' words that the temple was for all nations to pray had been preset in Isaiah. Jesus' suffering was also predicted in Isaiah. Jesus' ministry was also pre-recorded in Isaiah. Jesus' expression of God as our Father was also pre-recorded in Isaiah. Isaiah 40 verse 3 pre-records the beginning of Jesus' ministry and also John the Baptist. And Isaiah 64 verse 8 pre-records Jesus' words of calling God our Father and the end of his ministry. Fifth point, Isaiah proclaimed to the whole world to praise God's glory. God is more than worthy of praise. We were born in order to praise our Creator. Isaiah sang that all humans should praise God, who was to send his Son, Jesus Christ, for the salvation of the world. No news can overcome this or be bigger than this. St. Paul, who realized this at a later stage, confessed in one of his letters, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was laid again. Day 189, Isaiah 43-45 do not praise false gods. Because of God's love that set up Israel again as his people, South Judah that had sinned enormously would receive forgiveness and be given hope again. First point. Isaiah told South Judah that God was their only salvation and that they were God's witness. The reason God called Abraham's descendants my possession was firstly because he created them. The second was because he selected them. The third was because God called unto them. Hence, God regarded the people of South Judah with a great deal of love, and he promised them that they would be able to return from Babylon captivity. This promise can be traced back to Deuteronomy. And the Lord has declared this day, that you are his people, his treasured possession, as he promised, and that you are to keep all his commands. He has declared that he will send you in praises, fame and honor high above all the nations he has made, and that you will be a people holy to the Lord your God, as he promised. The relationship between God and South Judah were inseparable. In reality, the people of South Judah did not contribute much in this relationship. This relationship was maintained through God's grace. Through this grace, God had promised them their restoration after Babylon captivity. Thus, South Judah was to be God's witness. Second point, God's people will be renewed after singing God's praises. God told Isaiah of his plans, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and the streams in the wasteland. The reason why God created humans was so that they can continue God's new work. Through Isaiah, God said that although the people had sinned, God would forgive them nevertheless. If it was not for God's deep mercy and love, how could humans continue on living? God punished the people according to their sin and then restored them. The punishment for South Judah was Babylon captivity. God had warned of the stages of punishment according to a kingdom of priests back when he made the covenant with them and now it was really time for the third level of punishment. Your first father sinned, 
those I sent to teach you leveled against me. So I disgraced the dignitaries of your temple. I consigned Jacob to destruction and Israel to scorn. Third point, Isaiah warned the people to stop serving idols and to return to God. God gave the promise to the people of South Judah through Isaiah that he would protect them. We can see just how deeply God loved Abraham's descendants through the Bible. The first was my servant Jacob. The name Jacob meant grabbing unto the hill. The second was my chosen Israel. Israel meant with God. The third was Joshua, whom I chose. Joshua was one who was righteous and obedient to God. In Isaiah chapter 44, another name for God appears. This is the King of Israel, the Savior of Israel, Savior of Israel, God the Creator, and so on. Isaiah, moreover, refers to God as Israel's Savior, the Porter, Lord of all the land, our Father, and beyond. Through Isaiah, God spoke about those who made idols, who shapes a God and casts an idol which can profit nothing. People who do that will be put to shame. Such craftsmen are only human beings. Let them all come together and take their stand. They will be brought down to terror and shame. As such, God rebuked the idol makers. All of God's creation was to obey and believe in God only. Therefore, God told the people to turn to him. God said that if they repented, God would turn away his anger. Fourth point, God used Assyria, Babylon, Persia as his tools to manage a kingdom of priests. God said to Isaiah that he would use Cyrus II of Persia to make the captives of the Babylonian Empire return to Jerusalem in order to restore them. Later on, God used Cyrus II in Persia to write a decree to command this. God had prepared Cyrus II with plans to restore the Jerusalem temple and also the Jerusalem city. God governs history. God's plan eventually became implemented for the people of South Judah. No matter how strong or powerful the empire was, they could not overrule God. Cyrus II and the Persian Empire were used for God's joy, and we too should pray with hopes to bring joy to God's vision. Fifth point, in order to let everyone know that God managed the whole world, God used Cyrus II of Persia. God showed Isaiah how the Babylon captivity contained hope. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. There was a reason why God laid the Persian Empire and Cyrus II. God explained that he would use Cyrus II in order to show how God governed over all the kings and all the empires. God furthermore told Isaiah that he was the God of salvation. It does not matter where you are from or what gender you are, or how much prestige you have when it comes to God's salvation. It all comes down to whether you have faith in God or not. Later on, St. Paul confessed, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledged that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Day 190, Isaiah 46-50 Scholar's Tongue God was the God of power who saved not only the people of South Judah who were oppressed by surrounding nations, but also all the people in this world. First point, to the people of South Judah who worshipped idols, God asked whether there was another savior for them other than God. God proclaimed through Isaiah 
that the idols of Babylon would be destroyed. Bel bows down. Nebo stoops low. Their idols are borne by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They stoop and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. This was the official statement from God, that Babylon will fall in the hands of Persia. I will punish Baal in Babylon and make him spew out what he has swallowed. The nations will no longer stream to him, and the wall of Babylon will fall. Through this, God also added that he would look over those who remained in South Judah until the end. God continued to promise the restoration of South Judah. God first told them to repent for their sins in idol worship. God furthermore told the people to remember God's history and to repent. Moses had also emphasized to the people to remember what God did for them. Remember the days of old. Consider the generations long past. Ask your father and he will tell you, your elders, and they will explain to you the reason why God emphasized for the people to repent was because he loved and wanted to forgive them. A second point. God first used Babylon as his tool, and then they became the subject of God's judgment. Although South Judah had not yet fallen in the hands of Babylon, God pre-told Isaiah that Babylon will fall to dust and ashes in the hands of Persia. Such a message could only be given through God. In the past, Job had expressed his pain as such. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Isaiah's prophecy came true in 539 BC, when Babylon fell in the hands of Persia. God told Isaiah that Babylon was to fall due to their arrogance. Babylon was brutal to its surrounding countries, and their arrogance grew. And thus, they could not escape God's judgment. Babylon's fall could not be helped by any of their idols. God moreover told Isaiah that not only would Babylon fall, but the countries that traded with Babylon would also fall. This included Egypt, Phoenicia, Arabia, and so on. Third point, God raised South Judah after their rightful punishment for his glory. God rebuked the people of South Judah for having no righteousness or truth. Since the days of Exodus, many people were stiff-necked, and this continued all throughout. They really did not care to listen to God. Despite so, God still had hopes to re-establish a kingdom of priests with these people once they were done being punished. God proclaimed through Isaiah of the new vision he had. You have heard these things. Look at them all. Will you not admit them? From now on, I will tell you of new things, of hidden things unknown to you. This was God explaining that he was the one who governed the world. The people during Isaiah's time did not know how God protected their ancestors. They thought that their privileges were simply normal. They failed to be thankful for God, their Creator. Thus, God revealed Himself to them. Fourth point, Isaiah sang of the coming of the Messiah, as well as the Messiah's salvation. Now, Isaiah started to sing his second song out of his four songs. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb, to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. 
I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach it to the ends of the earth. This was a song for the Messiah and his salvation. Isaiah sang of the Messiah, whom God knew from the womb and after birth. He had a sharp tongue like an arrow and bow. He would bring glory to Israel and make them rise high. He would also shine God's light to the ends of the earth. The Messiah was Jesus Christ. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. After Jesus said this, he looked toward the heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming, when no one can walk. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Fifth point. Isaiah praised God who gave him the ability to speak and to help others. God told Isaiah that the people of South Judah would be taken to Babylon as captives, but that they would not admit their sins and rather begrudge God. Now Isaiah went on to the third song. The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. I opened my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. This song sings of the Messiah's suffering, restoration, and victory. It also sings of the Messiah's teachings. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. God told them that he would restore them from their suffering. God pre-showed his love and compassion. Day 191, Isaiah 51-55 Blueprint of the Suffering Messiah the Savior, who was like an abundant stone by builders, would be used as the cornerstone in preparation of a wonderful event through God's grace. First point, God said that he would protect South Judah the way he protected Abraham. God told Isaiah that those who were righteous and turned to God would be consoled and saved. God promised that he would save South Judah the way he protected Abraham. Isaiah said that although the people would be taken as captives to Babylon, God will surely keep his promise and restore them. God gave Isaiah the courage and strength to believe in God the Creator. Second point. Mount Zion was to become the holy place that God ruled. God told Isaiah that Jerusalem would wake up and stand. This was a continuation of how Jerusalem, the capital of South Judah, would be restored. This was God saying that he would no longer let those who were uncircumcised walk around Jerusalem. God was remodeling Jerusalem which had become an evil place. Until now, Jerusalem was a place full of darkness. But God now commanded for Jerusalem to be cleansed and purified. This was much like God making human out of clay and then breathing life into their nostrils. This was God's grace and blessing, which he gave at no cost. For this is what the Lord says, You are sold for nothing, and without money you will be redeemed. When Isaiah heard God's promise, he praised the Lord. How beautiful on the mountains 
at the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. Isaiah's song contained the blessed news of South Judah's restoration, as well as God's deep grace. God told the people to stop making idols, and especially for the Levites to be more dedicated to their roles. Now, Isaiah went on to sing his final song. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond the death of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him, for what they were not told they will see, and what they have not heard they will understand. Third point, the story of the Messiah reflects God's glory and peace. God told Isaiah about Jesus Christ, who came as the Prince of Peace. Later, in Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering of Jesus Christ was shown. The image of Jesus Christ's suffering had no beauty. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Second, the image of Jesus' suffering was full of rejection from humans. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Third, the image of Jesus' suffering was brutal with stabbing and pain. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Fourth, the image of Jesus' suffering showed Jesus enduring through it. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Fifth, the image led unto Jesus taking up the cross. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. Isaiah preached song of Jesus' suffering, as well as the peace that was to be achieved through this. Fourth point, God's plan of salvation was to restore the people back to Jerusalem after their years as captives and then by sending the Messiah. South Judah was given the promise that they would become prosperous again in the future. When they eventually returned to Jerusalem, they would be able to settle again in their homeland. God furthermore promised them that they would no longer be ridiculed and mocked in Babylon. God promised the people mercy and blessing once they returned from Babylon. Although South Judah was to lose their land for 70 years, they would be restored by God after this time. God compared this to the time he promised Noah and his family after the flood. Fifth point, God planned to invite the whole world through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now God told Isaiah about how God's people were invited to God's feast. God gave a long-planned vision of eternal salvation. 
The most important thing here was that the people had their hearts on God. Anyone who had their full hearts on God could come to Him. This truly shed a light on how God was hard at work to make sure that all people from all nations had their hearts on God. God went as far as to send Jesus Christ in order to invite all nations to this feast. God told the people to repent, and then He would have mercy on them. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is dear. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and He will have mercy on them, and to our God, for He will freely pardon. Day 192, Isaiah 56-59 Sabbath and Watered Garden The devotion God is pleased with is to show effort to live according to His word, to love Him, and to sincerely love our neighbors. First point, God lets the whole world know that they could be saved through the court of the Gentiles in the Jerusalem temple. God told the people through Isaiah that judgment day was approaching, and so they were to be righteous and to keep Sabbath in order to receive God's blessing. God told the people that keeping Sabbath was the basis of the laws of a kingdom of priests. God furthermore told the people of how his vision extended to all nations, and this was shown through the court of the Gentiles in the Jerusalem temple. This was God's inviting all foreign people to come to his feast. There were many people who could not come as they did not know or keep to the laws in Deuteronomy. But God had made it so that anyone could come before God, even if they were not from South Judah, if they kept the laws of a kingdom of priests, then there would be a way. God emphasized that the court of the Gentiles was for anyone to come and pray to God. Second point, God rebuked the people of South Judah for their idol worship and lifestyle. God rebuked the sins of the leaders of South Judah through Isaiah. God outlined how they were lazy and greedy, as well as their other sins. Although their country was being threatened, they felt no responsibility. God also rebuked the corruption of South Judah. The biggest sin was their idol worship. God especially rebuked them for worshiping Molech. Ahaz had worshipped this false god, and so God rebuked the people for turning away from him. God promised them that although they had sinned, if they repented, then God would find ways to restore them. God's mercy and patience has no limit. God wanted to use them to bless all nations. Thus, God persuaded them, consulted them, and taught them. But the people still went in their evil ways and so could not escape God's punishment. Third point, God explained the fasting that he was happy to see. God told Isaiah to shout out loud for the repentance of the people of South Judah. As the trumpets were blown to warn the start of war, the people were to be warned that they did not have too much time left to repent. God furthermore rebuked them for their surface level faith and their fasting. God said that although they appeared to be obeying God on the surface, they did as they pleased on the knees. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, lovers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. God told Isaiah of the fasting that he looked favorably upon. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to lose the chains of injustice? and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. 
is it not to share your fruit with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to close them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Fourth point, to those who kept Sabbath and made it holy, God promised that He would make them into a well-watered garden. God told Isaiah that He would bless those who kept God's laws. God explained in detail of the things the people were not to do during Sabbath, as well as the blessings they would receive if they kept it. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please, On my holiday, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holiday honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words. Fifth point, God's justice and God's love are one. The reason for South Judah's punishment was not because God lacked power. These were the sins of the people. The first was their bloodshed and their lies. The second was their unrighteous trials. The third was their love of evil. And so God proclaimed that He would reveal justice among these people. Isaiah proclaimed the grace of God's righteousness. God punished the people because of His justice and forgave them because of His love. God's grace of a kingdom of God and His covenant was indeed amazing. Day 193 Isaiah 62-63 Hadziva and Beulah God, who participated in the affliction of Israel and wanted them to be restored fully, preached the beautiful news of salvation. First point, God spoke of how Jerusalem would be restored to its glory. Isaiah chapter 60 records a completely different outline about the restoration of Jerusalem compared to Isaiah chapter 47, which claimed the destruction of the Babylonian Empire. South Judah's restoration would enable the people to flourish in God's promised land, and they would no longer have to be the subject of mockery by their surrounding countries. They would ultimately be able to live as a holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. This was God telling them beforehand of how the Jerusalem walls and the Jerusalem temple would be restored during the Persian Empire. This can be found in Ezra and the Hemiah. God promised the people of South Judah that He would permit the restoration of the Jerusalem temple after their return from Babylonian captivity. In Babylon, they were unable to cultivate their own land. But to these people, God told them, that they would have their everlasting land. Even when things looked impossible to the people of South Judah, they were to look to God and to always have faith. Although they had their land taken away due to their disobedience, if they obeyed in the future, they would be restored to their land again. Second point, Isaiah proclaimed the coming of the Messiah. Those who were anointed in the Bible were largely categorized into priests, kings, and the Messiah. The first priest to be anointed was Aaron. The person to be anointed three times as king was David. The anointment of the Messiah was prophesied multiple times in the book of the prophets. What was written in Isaiah later became the Messiah's ministry and mission. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. Third point, through the Messiah, a kingdom of priests was to be completed through the kingdom of God. The Messiah's ministry was outlined by God through Isaiah. The first was that he would restore the destroyed city walls. The second was that he would save and restore all nations through God's covenant. The third was that he would restore the abundance. The fourth was that he would restore the people to receive God's blessing. Isaiah sang to God, for as the soil makes the sprout to come up, and a garden causes the seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness, and praise spring up before all nations. Fourth point, God called Jerusalem, Hepziva, and Beulah. What is about the Messiah's ministry continued. The first was that he did not bless. The second was that he would help restore a kingdom of priests. God called Jerusalem, Hepziva, and Beulah to speak of the new changes. Hepziva meant, My joy be with you, and Beulah reported to a married woman. God used these metaphors frequently to report to Israel. And this was also the main metaphor used in Hosea. As such, God had prepared for the changes in the people of South Judah when the Messiah came. For Jerusalem's restoration, God said that he would place a God who would not last or sleep in order to protect them. God did not only want this for South Judah, but for all nations. Fifth point. Isaiah did not stop praying for the people of South Judah. Although God punished the people of South Judah for their disobedience, he still had no intention of forever leaving them. Humans often give up on themselves and give up on God, but God does not give up on us. God never gives up on his love for us. Isaiah, who was able to feel God's tremendous love, sang, Look down from heaven and see, from your lofty throne, holy and glorious. Where are your zeal and your might? Your tenderness and compassion are withheld from us. But you are our Father, though Abraham does not know us, or Israel acknowledge us. You, Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer from of old, is your name. Why, Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so we do not revere you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes that are your inheritance. Day 194, Isaiah 64-66 Glory and Peace God promised the new heaven and new earth and the complete restoration and glory of Israel, which would be realized after all sins had been forgiven. First point, Isaiah sang that God was our Father and that He was the Porter. Isaiah prayed for the people of South Judah. Isaiah was the song of God's power. Isaiah then confessed the sins of his people. Isaiah sang of God the Creator and thanked God for his plans to save Israel. Isaiah in chapter 29 referred to God as the porter. Now in Isaiah 64, he used the metaphor of God as the porter and the people as his clay and that the porter would show grace and mercy. Second point, to Isaiah's prayer for the people of South Judah, God's response was that he would protect the remaining people. In response to Isaiah's prayer 
for the people of South Judah, God said that He would punish the people for their sins and grant mercy on their surrounding nations. God added that He would save and protect those who remained behind. However, to those who refused to repent until the end, God proclaimed severe punishment. Third point, the book of Isaiah and Revelation both focuses on the new heavens and the new earth. God's vision of the new heavens and the new earth was given to Isaiah and also to John in Revelation. In Isaiah, it is recorded, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Next is the record in Revelation. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. God's vision of the new heavens and the new earth was a place where past memory did not exist. No sound of crying or lament could be heard. No child or old person had to die. No hard work was in vain, and there was no disaster. God replied before one called to him, and God would always be there to listen. Fourth point. God rebuked those who worshipped superficially. God rebuked the people who worshipped God only on the surface. God does not find pleasure in this. He finds pleasure in heartful worship. God also listens to those who have distress in their hearts and others and fears God's laws. God looked favorably upon David and Solomon's worship. God also listened to Isaiah's prayer, who prayed with an honest and fearful heart. God used the metaphor of a child being born to symbolize the restoration of Jerusalem and confirmed that it would indeed be restored. Fifth point, God proclaimed that after his final judgment, those who remained would return as priests and Levites the kingdom of priests. To those who refused to repent until the end, God proclaimed, See, the Lord is coming with fire, and his chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. God furthermore claimed that those who were to remain behind would later become priests and Levites, and they would praise God in the newly restored Jerusalem temple, and I will select some of them, also to be priests and Levites, says the Lord, as the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord. So will your name and descendants endure, from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. Day 195, Micah 1 to 3. Zion without glory. Watching the age when the oppression of the powerful toward the weak prevailed, God declared judgment against the oppressors. First point. Micah and Isaiah ministered around the same period in South Judah. In the book of Micah, the message can be divided into three parts. The first part is chapters 1 to 2, and it starts by addressing all the people of South Judah. The second message is chapters 3 to 5, and it starts by addressing the heads of Jacob and the leaders of Israel. The third message is chapters 6 to 7, and it starts by telling the people to listen to God's message. Micah was from a small town in South Judah, and he ministered during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah in 8th century BC, along with the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah's ministry focused on South Judah's international relations 
and mica focused on the wrongful behavior of the people as they isolated the poor and accepted bribery during trial. Mica moreover delivers God's everlasting love and also explained the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Second point, Micah rebuked Samaria, the capital city of North Israel, and Jerusalem, the capital city of South Judah. Through Micah, God proclaimed judgment on both North Israel and South Judah. All this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the people of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Micah especially rebuked the leaders of Samaria and Jerusalem. Micah furthermore revealed God's heart towards the small town of Bethlehem. The Samaria castle walls were established during the reign of King Omni, and it was besieged by Assyria for three years then invaded and eventually destroyed in 722 BC. The Jerusalem castle and walls fell in the hands of Babylon in 586 BC, after being attacked for 18 months. God proclaimed that eventually the entire South Judah would fall. Third point, Micah pointed out the sins of the leaders of the capital cities. Through Micah, God rebuked the behavior of the leaders. The behavior of the leaders of the two capital cities at the time was isolation of the poor and even stealing from the poor. The religious leaders also committed a great deal of evil. The false prophets of those days told lies and became popular among the people. Thus, their sins were outlined and rebuked. The people of South Judah at the time had no heart to listen to God, but rather were shocked in their own greed. The reason for this was simple, when they became prosperous and abundant through their evil. They no longer felt the need to rely on God, and so God sent Micah to rebuke them. First point, Micah criticized the sins of the false prophets priests, and the headers. Micah's second message was directed at the leaders. The leaders of the two capital cities at the time did not carry out justice. They carried out evil and raided their people. As for the false prophets, they did not care to deliver God's message, but rather spoke for their own benefits and profits. And so, God proclaimed punishment on them. God moreover rebuked the sins of the leaders of South Judah, priests, and the prophets. The people at the time accepted bribery during trial, and this was completely opposite to the days of David. David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. Fifth point, Micah rebuked the people for building Jerusalem with Zion's blood. Through the prophet Micah, God told the people of Samaria that they did not once keep to the laws or policies of a kingdom of priests. This was largely down to the fact that the 19 kings of North Israel all went in the way of Jeroboam. South Judah also became a place with no righteousness or justice. Micah proclaimed, but as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. God proclaimed that he would judge the people who constructed the Jerusalem temple through giant's blood. Day 196, Micah 4-7, Zion Resort of Glory. Micah declared a wonderful plan that in the holy city where God's justice and laws overflowed, Israel would live at his people. First point, Micah proclaimed of the new kingdom of the Messiah. 
the kingdom of the Messiah was explained by God. It was to be established on God's decided day and also end on the decided day. The kingdom of the Messiah was for all nations. It was also one that contained God's judgment. It did not have any wars and it had everlasting peace. God proclaimed this kingdom and how it would be given to those who remained. God explained that those who persevered through the Babylon captivity would be able to experience the Messiah's kingdom. God would console these people. Second point, the Magi were able to find out the place of the Messiah's birth through the record of Micah. To South Judah, who tried to resist the attack of the Assyrian army, Micah delivered God's message of the birthplace of the Messiah, which was to be a small town called Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler of Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Later on, the Magi were able to find out the birthplace of Jesus through this record. By seeing a star, the Magi knew that the king had been born, and so when they asked King Herod where the king had been born, Herod asked the priests and the teachers of the law. As such, Micah and Isaiah pre-told the birth of the Messiah. Thus, the Old Testament is the story of Jesus Christ and the framework of the four Gospels. All the 66 books in the Bible is Jesus' one story, the story of Jesus' crucifixion. Micah went on to explain how Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, and then he would save the entire world. At the time, South Judah had to be punished for their sins. But the reason for telling them this was in hopes that they might repent and turn to God. God's management of the world, which was detailed by Isaiah, was confirmed again by Micah. Third point, the Messiah would come and purify the world from idol worship. God told Micah that the Messiah would govern the whole world. God furthermore promised that he would restore South Judah through those who remained. As such, God's interest in the remaining people knew no end. God moreover said that the Messiah would purify the world. The Messiah would purify the world from idol worship and from wars. God proclaimed that all would be renewed on the day that the Messiah came. On that day of judgment, the people would not be able to protect any of their possessions. All they would be able to do is to turn to God and ask for His protection. God governs the whole world. This cannot be emphasized enough. Fourth point, Micah outlines the faults of South Judah in detail. Now, it was Micah's last message. This message contained Micah's rebuke of people's sins. Here, God was the judge and the people were up for trial. The witnesses were the mountains and the land. First, God spoke, My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Barak king of Moab approached and what Balaam son of Beor answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. God referred to Exodus and the instant of Barak and Balaam to reveal his righteousness. God furthermore told the people that they only worshipped him on the surface. To the people of South Judah who misunderstood God, God explained all that he had done for them up until now. What God wanted was for them to be at peace. 
with their neighbors and not to be arrogant. Offering for the sake of offering was not what God wanted. He wanted them to practice true holiness in their everyday lives. Fifth point, Micah praised God by singing that there was none other like him. God lamented over the arrogance of the people of South Judah to Micah. God lamented over their arrogance, the leaders, and the fall of the relationship between the people. When Micah heard this, he repented on behalf of the people. God heard this and then promised again that he would restore them after their punishment. Micah's prayer continued, Shepherd your people with your staff. The flock of your inheritance, which lives by itself in a forest, in fertile pasture lands. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in days long ago. This was Micah asking God the shepherd to protect his lamb. Micah also offered God praise. Micah sang that there was none other like God. God granted the people of South Judah the blessing. He had granted Abraham. Day 197, 2 Kings 21 to 23. Final evaluation of monarchy. During the rule of Manasseh, the evils of royal rule, which God warned about, became clearly revealed. The time came near when the final settlement of the 500 years of monarchy was carried out. First point. When Manasseh became king of South Judah, the fall of monarchy, which was warned by Samuel, in the early days started to become reality. Manasseh's rule truly showed that monarchy was ultimately to come to an end as warned previously by Samuel. Manasseh did such evil in the eyes of the Lord that God proclaimed destruction on him. After Manasseh died, his son Ammon took over, and he followed in the ways of his father. Consequently, he was killed by his servants, but the people of South Judah attacked the servants who killed him and made Ammon's son Josiah the next king. Josiah became king at the young age of eight, but despite so, he did not follow in the way of his grandfather and father, but rather carried out justice. During the reign of Josiah, Passover, which had not been kept since the days of Samuel, was kept. Since the division of Israel into the north and south, Josiah was the king who tried his best to keep to the laws of the kingdom of priests. Despite Josiah's efforts, God still did not calm his anger against South Judah. The punishment of South Judah had already been decided. Later, Josiah died in war when the Egyptian king went by South Judah to go to war. To evaluate the system of monarchy thus far, it started with Saul, and then was passed to David, and then Solomon. Each ruled for 40 years, and so their total number of years was 120. After Solomon's death, the country was divided, and this continued for 200 years. North Israel was maintained for 200 years, and during this time, 19 kings reigned with multiple coup d'etats in between, and they fell in the hands of Assyria. South Judah went on for a further 150 years and then fell in the hands of Babylon. Twenty of David's descendants reigned as kings in South Judah. The few kings of South Judah who went in the way of David were firstly Asa, the third king. The second was Jehoshaphat, the fourth king. The third was Joash, the eighth king. The fourth was Hezekiah, the thirteenth king. The fifth was Josiah, the sixteenth king. After finding the books of Moses' laws, Josiah read it with the people of South Judah. The fair and righteous God now weighed everything and decided to put an end 
to the 350 years of South Judah. This marked the end of the monarchy system as a whole. Second point, King Manasseh did not follow in the footsteps of Hezekiah or David, but rather in the way of the kings of North Israel. Manasseh took over the reign of Hezekiah as the 14th king of South Judah at the age of 12. Among the 20 kings of South Judah, he reigned for the longest, 55 years. His evil was so vast that it was truly a pitiful sight. Manasseh worshipped idols and Molech, mocked the temple, and did other countless evil. It got to the point of worshipping idols in the Jerusalem temple. Thus, he was put aside as the worst king, that he was wicked in the eyes of the Lord, was emphasized three times in 2 Kings chapter 21. Manasseh's son Ammon reigned after his father as the 15th king of South Judah. Ammon's sins equated to that of his father. Third point, Josiah did not follow in his father Ammon or his grandfather Manasseh's way, but rather in the way of God's servant David. After Manasseh and Ammon was Josiah. He became the 16th king of South Judah at the age of eight. Although he became king at a very young age, he did not follow in his grandfather or father's footsteps, but later chose to go in the way of David. Thus, he was righteous in the eyes of the Lord. Manasseh and Ammon showed interest in worshiping idols, but Josiah was interested in God's temple. In the process of cleansing the temple, the high priest Hilkiah discovered the book of laws written by Moses. Josiah repented before God and truly turned to him. When Josiah read the book of the laws, he went to find the prophet Huldah, who was living in Jerusalem at the time. The content of what was said through the prophet Huldah can be found in 2 Kings 22 verses 16 to 17. After hearing this, Josiah repented before God, and so God postponed judgment to after Josiah's slain. All in all, God's judgment on South Judah occurred in 586 BC with the attack of Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon. Fourth point, Josiah thoroughly studied Moses' laws and desired to live by a kingdom of priests. The laws of a kingdom of priests which was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, became hard again to South Judah through Josiah. Josiah held a religious reformation which involved the whole nation reading the books in the temple and renewing their covenant. Next, Josiah got rid of all the idols in South Judah. Josiah, furthermore, got rid of all the idols in North Israel. Next thing he did was to keep Passover. Fifth point, with the death of Josiah began the opening of the end of 500 years of monarchy. In 609 BC, the king of Egypt decided to make an alliance with the remaining Assyrian troops and to bloom again as a powerful empire. It was here that Josiah of South Judah tried to stop this war and was killed in the fields. After the death of Josiah, things started to go downhill for South Judah. Josiah's sons, Jehu Ahaz and Jehu Yakim, took over from their father, but this was the period when Babylon started to grow more powerful. Jehu Ahaz became the 17th king of South Judah. He was appointed by the people but his reign only lasted for three months. As he was taken to Egypt, where he was killed, the king of Egypt then made Jehoiakim the next king. Jehoiakim spent the first part of his reign offering tribute to Egypt, and then when Babylon started to threaten South Judah, he started to send tribute to Babylon as well. And Egypt eventually fell in 605 BC. 
Matthew 198, Jephaniah 123, Jephaniah's story of lament. The righteous who seek God and His justice humbly, even in the middle of the darkness of history, can receive God's protection. First point, God proclaimed the day of the Lord to the prophet Jephaniah. The prophet Jephaniah was the fourth generation of Hezekiah's family. Although Jephaniah was a member of Josiah's family, he had to proclaim the destruction of South Judah. Like God, he also deeply wanted the people to repent and to change. God told through Jephaniah of the people who were to receive punishment. The first regarded idol worshippers. The second regarded the leaders of South Judah who led the people in evil ways. The third regarded the traitors. The fourth regarded those who did not worship God. As such, God rebuked those who worshipped idols, those who worshipped both God and other idols, and also those who did not even care to know about God. God warned the people that His day would soon come. Second point, those who kept God's laws were the remnants that God departed to. God told through Jephaniah that He would make the whole world repent. The few people who kept their faith until the end would become God's remnant. Concerning the remnants, Jephaniah and Habakkuk explained who they were in detail. The remnants would keep God's laws and decrees and carry out justice and righteousness. They would not tell lies and have faith in God despite the fears they had. The remnants recorded in the Bible include Joshua and Caleb, who separated themselves from the other ten leaders. The 300 soldiers among the 32,000 during the times of Gideon. The 7,000 who refused to kneel down to Baal during the reign of Ahaz and Jezebel. Those who believed in God in South Judah despite others going in the wrong direction. Daniel and his three friends who were taken as captives to Babylon, as well as 10,000 who went with Ezekiel. All these people were a minority, but they were the ones who gave God the most joy and hope. Third point, God proclaimed judgment on the surrounding countries of South Judah through Jephaniah. After proclaiming judgment on South Judah, God proclaimed judgment on their surrounding countries. The first was Philistine, the second was Moab and Ammon. The third was Cush. The fourth was Assyria. God explained in detail the reasons behind their judgment. This is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty. First point, God proclaimed judgment on Jerusalem, which became a desolate place. Through Jephaniah, God outlined the sins of Jerusalem one by one. The first was that they were rebellious, dirty, and unjust. The second was that they did not listen to God's orders or laws. The third was that they did not turn to God nor look for Him. The fourth was that the Jerusalem leaders were like roaring lions. The fifth was that the prophets were arrogant, who did evil in the temple and did not keep the laws. Although God told them this specifically, they still did not repent. Now they could not escape God's judgment. Fifth point, God could not conceal His joy towards the people who persevered until the end with God's laws. God told Jephaniah of His hope and salvation for the remnants. They were to sing God's praises. God did not give up on hope for the people of Jerusalem until the end. Thus, judgment did not mean the end, but was a means to re-establish a kingdom of priests. God could not conceal His joy towards the small number of people who believed in Him 
and persevered through their circumstances with the faith. Day 199, Habakkuk 1 to 3. Habakkuk's Song of Faith. The pride of joy overflowed in those who believed in God, who moved the world in His great sovereign administration and practiced justice. First point. Habakkuk's first question was why God did not punish the evil of South Judah. Habakkuk ministered during the time when Babylon was growing into a full-scale empire. Habakkuk worked in the same period as Jeremiah during the reign of Josiah and Jehoiakim. Habakkuk deeply lamented over South Judah's sins and cried out to God. The first question he had to God was why he did not judge South Judah that was full of evil. Habakkuk used words such as rebellious, violent, rape, and conflict to describe South Judah's sins. Looking at their sins, Habakkuk asked God whether he saw what was going on, and if so, why he was ignoring them. But this was Habakkuk's misunderstanding. God is righteous and just, and the fault lied in the evil of humans. Habakkuk's complaint was not towards God, but towards the people. God told him that he would use Babylon as a tool to punish South Judah. This was fulfilled in 586 BC when South Judah fell in the hands of Babylon. Second point. Habakkuk's second question was why God used the evil Babylon to punish South Judah. Babylon was expanding so rapidly as an empire that it was almost like seeing a fisherman raiding all the fish at super speed. Habakkuk therefore questioned why God used Babylon, who was more evil than South Judah, to punish them. At this, God answered him. God explained that he who was fair and just managed a kingdom of priests in his way. Therefore, a righteous person was to live by faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Third point, God explained the reason why Babylon was selected as God's tool for judgment. The reason Babylon was most certainly to fall was because of their greed. The second was because of their unethical profit. The third was because of the blood they shed. The fourth was because they spread evil influence on others. The fifth was because of their idol worship. Fourth point, Habakkuk pleaded to God to ensure judgment on South Judah and Babylon. When Habakkuk heard God's reply, he praised God for his mercy. He furthermore praised God's judgment. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. Fifth point, Habakkuk praised God for his salvation of restoration of South Judah after their punishment. Habakkuk's praise continued. He sung that there would be no victories grape trees or olive trees or livestock left in South Judah symbolized that it was soon to completely fall. Habakkuk prayed that even when it came to this, he would still rejoice in God. Day 200, Nahum 1-3 Nahum and Jonah in Assyria Justice for all nations God who had given an opportunity to Assyria to be saved through Jonah, declared judgment against them that did not repent from its evil ways. First point, both Jonah and Nahum delivered God's messages to Assyria. God had delivered Nineveh through the hands of Jonah 150 years ago, but this time God proclaimed the destruction of the Assyrian Empire through the prophet Nahum. To compare the book of Jonah 
and the book of Nahum. In the book of Jonah, God granted mercy, but in the book of Nahum, God declared judgment. In the book of Jonah, the people repented, but in the book of Nahum, the people opposed. Through Nahum, God revealed his justice through judgment, as well as his mercy. God is slow to anger, is forever patient, and waits for humans to repent. However, God will certainly judge those who do not repent until the end, because God is the God of justice. Second point, the prophet Nahum proclaimed that Nineveh would be destroyed by water. Prophet Nahum declared that Nineveh would be judged by water and that God would completely destroy the city. After its destruction, God would never bring destruction on them again. When Assyria fell, it meant that South Judah no longer had to pay them tribute. Third point, Nahum claimed that Nineveh would become desolate. When Nineveh fell, it meant that South Judah could be liberated from Assyria. The capital city of Assyria, Nineveh, was the first to fall due to a fatal attack in 612 BC by Mede and Babylon. Assyria changed their capital to Haran, but Haran also fell in 609 BC. The ultimate fall of Assyria was in 605 BC at the Battle of Carchemish. After 520 years, Assyria came to a final cross. Fourth point, Nahum claimed that Nineveh was to fall as it was a city of blood. The reason God proclaimed the destruction of Nineveh was because it was full of violence and lies. It also had a terrible influence on its surrounding countries. God called Nineveh a city of blood, as well as a blood castle, not only referring to their violence, but also to explain what will happen to them soon. Assyria, who had no idea that they would come to an end, was destroyed by God. By using the metaphor of a fig tree and a grasshopper, God confirmed his judgment on Assyria. Fifth point, the Assyrian kings boasted of their brutality. The fall of the Assyrian Empire was great news for their surrounding countries. This was because they had practiced such violence and authority whilst expanding their empire. Nineveh, that was known for its lavishness, was soon to fall and turn into a blood castle. The people of Assyria would die, but no one would turn to help. Although they were granted mercy and salvation by God in the past, now their arrogance had reached the ultimate level and they were faced with destruction. Day 201 Joel 1-3 Joel's Dream and Vision The Way of Life the people of Israel were to choose in front of the imminent day of the Lord was to tear their heart sincerely, repent, and come before God. First point. Through the prophet Joel, God proclaimed that South Judah's disarray would turn into God's day. It is assumed that prophet Joel ministered during the times of King Joash, but the exact period of his ministry is unknown. Joel declared that South Judah would face immense punishment if they did not repent. If they turned from their sins and repented, God would grant his mercy and let them live under his rule. Joel cried for the sins of the people as well as for the people to repent. He was full of sadness for the people as they did not have the heart to listen. He was sad, as God's heart was full of sadness. Second point, Joel prayed whilst thinking about the coming of God's day. Joel declared a fasting prayer for the people, whilst telling them that the Lord's day was approaching. Although they could not escape their punishment, Joel still told the people to come together 
at a time of national emergency. Joel explained to the people that they were not to try and solve the grasshopper disaster through wisdom, but by acknowledging that the Lord's Day was coming. Things were about to get a lot more serious than grasshoppers. The reason for their punishment was due to their constant sins. God punished the people in hopes that they would repent. God therefore sent Joel to them with hope. Joel declared that the people should fast and pray to God leading up to his judgment. Third point, Joel told the people that no one would be able to escape God's day, and so they were not to rip their robes, but leather their hearts. God declared through Joel that his day was approaching. No one would be able to escape God's judgment on this day. Joel told the people to stand before God and to repent. He told them to fast, cry, lament, and repent. He furthermore told them to rip their hearts and to return to God. Tearing the robes here symbolized the lamenting. Tearing the robes is recorded a few times in the Bible. To look at five examples, Jacob tore his robes when he heard that Joseph died. Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, died, and Moses told Aaron not to tear his robes or to show sadness. Caleb tore his robes in Kadesh Barnea after spying on Canaan. Joshua tore his robes when the Israelites were unsuccessful at the Battle of Ai. David tore his robes after hearing the death of Saul. But to the people of South Judah, Joel told them not only to rip their robes, but to tear their hearts. This way, perhaps God would have mercy on them. Fourth point, Joel proclaimed that whoever called to God would be given salvation, and this was later reported to by Peter and St. Paul. Joel told every single person to fast and to repent. To the priests, he told them to have pity on the people and to pray for them. The priests were to pray for God's mercy on the people, for God's protection, and also that the foreign nations would not ridicule them. As such, Joel declared that those who fasted and truly repented before God would be able to receive His mercy. God's mercy involved the people overcoming their fear and driving away their enemies. It also involved God's abundance and His restoration. They would be able to live whilst singing His praise. God would forever be their God. God also promised them his salvation. Fifth point, God's judgment was his management of the world and furthermore, a symbol of his love for the entire world. God told Joel to listen for the final judgment. God used the image of their harvest being trampled and the buds becoming overflown to symbolize the day of judgment. This was used again in Revelation. However, Joel declared that God's final day of judgment would also be the day of salvation. Sadness continued for God as sins became repeated in South Judah. What God wanted was for them to repent and to become God's people. God not only wanted this for the people of South Judah, but also for the whole world, because He has love for all nations. Day 202, 2 Kings 24 and Jeremiah 1 to 3. Jeremiah, the prophet of tears. Jeremiah was sent to persuade South Judah for the last time, before the day of their destruction struck, as their judgment had already been decided by God. First point, God claimed the end of the monarchy system to Jeremiah. God gave three evaluations regarding the 500 years of monarchy. The first was during the days of Samuel, that the king would enslave all the people 
for his own benefit. The second was the mid-evaluation during the days of Isaiah. This was that God would destroy North Israel, but he would maintain South Judah. The third was during the days of Jeremiah, which was the final evaluation. This was God declaring the end of the monarchy. God told Jeremiah about the fall of South Judah and also the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. God told Jeremiah that the fall of South Judah was not the end, but his brief discipline. This was in order to restore a kingdom of priests. Second point, 2 Kings chapter 24 and Jeremiah chapters 1 to 38 should be read together through tongue. Babylon attacked Egypt, whom South Judah was relying on, and Egypt soon became completely desolate. The attack on Jerusalem from Babylon started during the reign of the 18th king Jehoiakim, and God explained to Jeremiah why South Judah was being attacked. God clearly explained that it was because of the sins of Manasseh. During the first attack on South Judah, Babylon took the first group of captives, who was Daniel, and his three friends as well as making South Judah pay an enormous amount of tribute. Daniel recorded this in his book. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles from the temple of his God in Babylonia, and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. After the first attack on Jerusalem by Babylon, Jehoiakim died, and his son Jehoiachin became the 19th king of South Judah, but he also did evil just like his father. The Babylon Empire attacked once again, and this time they took Ezekiel and 10,000 other skilled workers as their captives. Like the first time, the second round of captives was taken, along with some articles from the temple. Zedekiah replaced his nephew Jehoiachin as a king. Third point, Jeremiah explained the 70 years of captivity through the big picture. God gave Jeremiah the big picture of why the people had to be taken as captives to Babylon for 70 years. The opening of this picture was Daniel chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 1, we can compare the objective of the Babylonian Empire and also God's objective concerning captivity. Thus, Babylon's reason for taking Daniel and his friends in 605 BC was to practice their Babylonian ideology through them. But for God, his project for a kingdom of priests became re-established. The middle part of this picture was the book of Ezekiel. In 598 BC, Babylon took the second round of captives, which included Ezekiel and 10,000 other skilled workers. Eleven years later, the majority of people were taken as the third group of captives, excluding those who were able to work. To these people who were taken as captives, Jeremiah wrote letters to persuade the people to turn to God. The conclusion to this big picture was Ezra chapter 1. In 537 BC, Babylon fell, and the newly risen Persian Empire enabled the captives to return to Jerusalem after 70 years since the taking of Daniel and his three friends. 
the first growth return went back in 537 BC. This was fulfillment of God's words through Jeremiah. Jerubbabel and 49,897 people returned to Jerusalem, with 5,400 pieces of articles of the Jerusalem temple. The times when Jeremiah ministered were the darkest times of South Judah. God had already made up his mind, and nothing could change it. Jeremiah was called around the age of 20. This was possible as he was educated by his father, Hilkiah, who was a priest. Jeremiah's mission was to deliver God's message and world management through Athria, Babylon, and Persia. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to unroot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Fourth point, God explained the sins of South Judah in thorough detail. Through Jeremiah, God told the people of the past of their ancestors. God told them how during the 40 years in the desert, he made a covenant with their ancestors to establish a kingdom of priests and for the people to become his holy people. God added that Israel left God with their sins. God rebuked the leaders who led the people in wrong directions. God furthermore addressed the sins of the people. The first was that they left God. The second was that they relied on their surrounding countries. The third was that they worshipped other idols. The fourth was that they abused the poor. Thus, they could not escape God's judgment. Fifth point, God rebuked the people of South Judah for following the sins of those Israel. God told Jeremiah why the people of South Judah could not avoid God's punishment. God outlined the arrogance of the people. God rebuked them for following in the sins of those Israel. God told them that despite seeing those Israel fall due to their sins, they still went in the same direction. Despite Josiah's religious reformation, they still did not turn back to God. God explained that they could not avoid their punishment, but once their punishment was over, they would repent and be able to return to Jerusalem. God truly wished for the people to repent. Day 203, Jeremiah 4-6 God who seeks one person God could not find one single righteous person in South Judah who could prevent the destruction of Jerusalem and so God expressed his regrettable and unfortunate state of mind. First point, God told the people of South Judah to repent through Jeremiah. God spoke to the people of South Judah through Jeremiah. If you, Israel, will return, then return to me, declares the Lord. God moreover told them how to repent. The first was for them to get rid of evil and not to be shaken. The second was for them to live a righteous and just life. The third was for them to not abuse their land. The fourth was for them to approach circumcision with the right heart and to turn to God. But as they refused to do so, God declared that He would strike them through their surrounding countries, raise the signal to go to Zion, flee for safety without delay, for I am bringing disaster from the north, even terrible destruction. A lion has come out of his lair, a destroyer of nations has set out. He has left his place to lay west your land. Your towns will lie in ruins without inhabitant. God told Jeremiah that he would punish them, but this came from a place of deep love and mercy. Second point, Jeremiah cried due to the sins of the people of South Judah and said that his heart was sad. 
Oh, my anguish, my anguish, I ride in pain. Oh, the agony of my heart, my heart pounds with me. I cannot keep silent, for I have heard the sound of the trumpet. I have heard the battle cry that told Jeremiah that South Judah would become trumpeted by the Babylonians. Thus, Jeremiah lamented and grieved. The pain of his country was soon his pain. My people are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. Jeremiah felt the anguish of God. Third point. The reason God punished the south of Judah was because he could not find a single person who acted righteously or was searching for the truth. The reason for the fall of south of Judah was very clear. The first was because there was no one who was righteous. God explained that south of Judah was like Sodom and Gomorrah. But God still looked for those who searched for the truth. The second was because of idol worship. The third was because they did not accept God and ignored his prophets. God claimed that if there was one person who was righteous and just, he would forgive South Judah. But that one person did not exist. Fourth point, God explained that the reason South Judah was being punished was because of the evil of the false prophets and the priests. The reason God sent Babylon to South Judah was because of their sin. People of Israel declares the Lord, I am bringing a distant nation against you, an ancient and enduring nation, a people whose language you do not know, whose speech you do not understand. God continued to rebuke South Judah for their non-repentant hearts. Hear this, you foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear, because the South Judah did not keep their covenant with God or their relationships with their neighbors. All had fallen apart. The prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority, and my people love it this way. But what will you do in the end? This was why God was in deep anguish. Fifth point, God rebuked the prophets and the priests for making false prophecies and then feeling no shame. God told Jeremiah once again that their days of destruction were quickly emerging and that the Babylonian soldiers would come soon. God explained the reasons for their destruction. The first was because Jerusalem was full of violence and rage. The second was because they did not listen to God. The third was because of their greed. The fourth was because of their religious leaders who told false messages. The people of South Judah were disobedient and worshipped God only on the surface. God told Jeremiah that Babylon would be used as God's tool to furnish South Judah. Look, an army is coming from the land of the north. A great nation is being stirred up from the Andes of the earth. They are armed with the bow and spear. They are cruel and show no mercy. They sound like the roaring sea as they ride on their horses. They come like men in battle formation to attack you, daughter Zion. This caused Jeremiah great distress and pain. Jeremiah compared his pain to the pain of a woman giving birth and a parent who lost their child. The people of South Judah who had turned away from God were now to be punished. They are called rejected silver because the Lord has rejected them. Day 204, Jeremiah 7-9 idol worship and temple praise. Jeremiah cried as his heart throbbed in anguish for the people who did not repent or return to God. First point, the people of South Judah worshipped the idols and only worshipped God on the surface in the temple. 
Jeremiah 7 verses 1 to 15 was Jeremiah's temple sermon. God told Jeremiah of the worship he wanted. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, who come through these gates to watch the Lord. God wanted the people to worship with a clear heart and mind. No lies, justice to their neighbor. Care to the foreigners, orphans, and widows. No bloodshed and no idol worship. But the people of South Judah went all out on the idol worship. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, We are safe, safe to do all these detestable things. Has the house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Later on, Jesus made reference to this when he went to the Jerusalem temple and saw the people making the holy ground a den of robbers. It did not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Despite this, the people still did not repent. Second point, God told Jeremiah not to pray for the people of South Judah. Now, God told Jeremiah not to pray for the people of South Judah. So do not pray for these people, nor offer any plea or petition for them. Do not plead with me, for I will not listen to you. The people did not repent and continued on with their idol worship. God rebuked their disobedience and idol worship yet again. Since the day he delivered his people out of Egypt, he had raised many prophets and leaders, starting with Moses, in order to establish a kingdom of priests through them. But now, with these people, no hope was to be found. Third point, God told them how severe their punishment would be for idol worship. South Judah had gone so far with their idol worship that God said that they loved, worshipped, followed, obeyed, and prayed them. They had arrogance in their hearts. They felt no shame for their detestable ways. They refused to listen to God, and they did not care. They interpreted the laws in their own ways. How can you say, we are wise, for we have the law of the Lord, when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely? God expressed his heart through his laws. God had also delivered his message through many prophets. God did not want the people to obey like robots, but he did require them to make decisions and to be responsible. Their way of life now was a decision to worship idols and to do detestable things. Fourth point, Jeremiah lifted his lobes and lamented as the people did not have any intention to repent. Jeremiah chapter 8 is his lamenting song toward South Judah. To the people who did not care to repent, Jeremiah cried on their behalf. He lifted his heart. He was deeply distressed at the people who interpreted God's laws in their own ways and did not believe a single word he said. Chapter 9 continues with his lamenting song. South Judah, who told so many lies and led detestable lives, was a pitiful sight. All they did was cry out for what they wanted. God declared war on them, but they cried for peace. They only paid attention to the words of the false prophets, but this did not hide the truth that God would punish them. What the people of South Judah should have done was to face the facts and to obey God's decision. Fifth point, God's conclusion for South Judah was their close. God told Jeremiah of the close of South Judah. God explained of the pain they would experience from the Babylon Empire. God rebuked the people who felt no shame in their behavior. 
Their only hope was God, but they failed to see this. And so, God's conclusion was to lap up South Judah. Day 205, Jeremiah 10 to 13. Jeremiah's prayer for the people. Israel, who rejected the privilege and mission to be a holy nation and a kingdom of priests, and departed from God, were responsible for the result of their disobedience. First point, God taught the people of South Judah how pointless idol worship was. God told the people of South Judah through Jeremiah just how pointless idol worship was. The first point was that idols were manufactured by men and his tools. The second was that it was decorated using silver and gold and nails. The third was that it could not talk or walk. Fourth, it could not give curse or blessings to humans. Therefore, they were utterly pointless, and they were to fall to the ground when God punished the people. The people of South Judah at the time practiced idol worship to the extreme, and this was their big problem. They had taken in various idols and accepted them. God proclaimed that He was the only God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who would destroy all the man-made idols. The idols who did not build the heavens and the earth would all perish. They may appear to have power, but they had absolutely nothing. People should remember that God is the one and only God. Jeremiah taught the people the following. First, God's name is great and almighty. No one is like God. Second, God is the only God, and He is the everlasting God. Third, God built the universe with His almighty hands. Fourth, God governs the heavens and the earth. The people of South Judah who did not believe in this, were warned of the consequences of their actions. Second point, Jeremiah prayed for the people of South Judah yet again, despite God's burning anger against them. Jeremiah lamented as he saw God's burning anger against the people of South Judah. Woe to me because of my injury. My wound is incurable. Yet I said to myself, this is my sickness, and I must endure it. Jeremiah cried, as the people were so ignorant and arrogant and irresponsible. Although God told Jeremiah not to pray for them, Jeremiah knelt down again and prayed for them nevertheless. Third point, God reminded the people of South Judah of the covenant of a kingdom of priests. God reminded the people through Jeremiah of the covenant of a kingdom of priests. They have returned to the sins of their ancestors, who refused to listen to my words. They have followed other gods to serve them. Both Israel and Judah have broken the covenant I made with their ancestors. As the people had broken their side of the promise, they could no longer escape their punishment. Thus, God declared that He would not listen to Jeremiah's prayer for the people. Do not pray for these people or offer any plea or petition for them, because I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their distress. Fourth point, Jeremiah questioned God just as Habakkuk had questioned God. Jeremiah questioned God just as Habakkuk had questioned God regarding God's decision on the people of South Judah. You are always righteous, Lord, and I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? 
Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abound. It appeared to Jeremiah that the God of justice was letting the evil get away with their evil. This was the same question that Habakkuk had. As God had answered Habakkuk, he answered Jeremiah. God first woke Jeremiah from his distress. God told him that the suffering of Jeremiah would be much greater than the people of Anathos rebuking him now. God also told him of the destruction of South Judah. God declared that he would judge South Judah who focused on their house, their possession, the things they loved, their vineyard, and their happiness. God furthermore declared that Babylon would fall, but South Judah would be restored again. God's judgment did not only apply to South Judah, but to all those who obeyed and disobeyed. Fifth point, God used the metaphor of a rotten belt to explain the arrogance of South Judah. God used the metaphor of a rotten belt to Jeremiah to explain the sins of South Judah. God showed Jeremiah that South Judah's arrogance would rot away like the rotten belt. The belt is needed for the mid area and it is a necessary item. Likewise, the people of South Judah were a part of God and they needed to be with Him. However, they not only turned away from God but disobeyed Him. They needed God but they failed to see this. Next, God said that every wineskin should be filled with wine. God used this metaphor to reveal His anger that was like a wineskin fitted to burst that symbolized South Judah's arrogance. Next, God warned them that they would be taken as captive. God explained that everyone, including their king, would be taken captive. Third, God warned them they were to be punished for refusing to repent. Day 206, Jeremiah 14-16 Even if Moses and Samuel prayed for you, on the day when Israel admitted their sin of following evil ways, only then they were to see the bright light which shined in the darkness. First point, Jeremiah prayed three times for the people to return to the covenant of a kingdom of priests. As a sign of punishment, God sent South Judah a drought. The punishment of a drought was warned in Leviticus. When the people suffered from this, Jeremiah prayed for them. Jeremiah prayed that God would take away this punishment and show them his holy name. But God's mind was set as the people refused to listen and continued to go in their simple ways. Their sins were so severe that even when they fasted and prayed to God, God did not listen. Despite God's response, Jeremiah prayed to God once again. Jeremiah cried to God that the reason the people went in their evil ways was partly due to false prophets. So God told him that not only the false prophets, but also the people of South Judah would be punished. When God did not turn from his anger, even after Jeremiah's second prayer, Jeremiah prayed for the third time to God for him to remember the covenant he made with them. Because Jeremiah knew how God's heart burned for the people, he felt a strong desire to take responsibility and to lead the people back to God. Second point, when Jeremiah prayed for the people, God's response was that even if Moses or Samuel prayed, he would not turn from his decision. Although Jeremiah mentioned the covenant of a kingdom of priests, God still did not turn his anger from South Judah. God had firmly made up his mind. God declared that even if Moses or Samuel prayed for them, he would not listen. 
Previously, when Moses and Samuel prayed for the people, God had listened and changed his mind. Now God explained to Jeremiah exactly how the people of South Judah would be punished. God outlined that the people would be killed, taken as captive, and be judged by wild beasts. This was largely stemming from the sins of Manasseh. Third point, God gave strength and courage to Jeremiah, who was under great distress. When Jeremiah proclaimed the fall of South Judah, the king, leaders, people, and even the people from his hometown rebuked him and tried to kill him. Because of this, Jeremiah cried to God for protection. Lord, you understand. Remember me and care for me. Avenge me on my persecutors. You are long-suffering. Do not take me away. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. God heard this and gave him new strength and courage. God told Jeremiah the same thing he had said when he was called for the first time and gave him courage. Fourth point, to Jeremiah, who had to declare the fall of South Judah, God forbid him to do three things. God told Jeremiah not to do three things. The first was not to marry. Jeremiah, who was born in such dark and miserable times, was not to seek personal happiness. God told Jeremiah not to grow a family, but to focus entirely on the country. Second, God told Jeremiah not to go to funerals. This was because countless people were to die due to God's judgment. The third was not to go to a house where there was a feasting. This was because there would be no feasting due to God's judgment. Fifth point, the reason for God's judgment was because of South Judah's sins. God explained that he had patience for the people of South Judah, who refused to turn from their arrogant ways. Thus, for their sins, they were to be taken as captives to Babylon. This was exactly according to the records in Deuteronomy. God warned them in advance that if they did not keep to the laws of the kingdom of priests, this would surely happen. However, God added that he would restore them after their time as captives came to an end, and that restoration would take place as written in Deuteronomy. Jeremiah proclaimed that the people who worshipped idols would repent and return to God. Day 207, Jeremiah 17-20 Parsha beats Jeremiah. The current picture of South Judah was that idolatry was prevalent. The blood of the innocent was shed and they perpetrated the evil custom of sacrificing humans. First point, God declared that South Judah's sin would be engraved with an iron tool. To South Judah, who asked what their sin was, God once again outlined it for them. God explained that those who were righteous would be blessed, and those who left God would be cursed. For a tree to grow tall and healthy, it is important where it is planted. Depending on where it is planted, the outcome can vary dramatically. The people of South Judah would have benefited from planting themselves in the right place. But unfortunately, they planted themselves away from God. Jeremiah prayed for these people as well as himself. Second point. God warned that if anyone came into the Jerusalem temple to sell something or with business purposes on the Sabbath, he would set fire to the temple. The foundation of a kingdom of priests was Sabbath and the five offerings. A kingdom of priests was based on the foundations from Genesis chapter 1, and it focused on Sabbath, sabbatical year, jubilee, Passover, Feast of Harvest, and Feast of Tabernacle. 
The five offerings were the burnt grain, fellowship, sin, and guilt offerings. But the people of South Judah failed to keep even Sabbaths. Thus, God rebuked the people through Jeremiah. God explained that those who kept Sabbaths holy would be blessed, and those who did otherwise would be cursed. Those who looked for opportunities during Sabbaths were warned by God. God had previously emphasized through Isaiah the importance of keeping Sabbath and to not carry out other activities during Sabbath. Later on, when the people who came back from captivity once again tried to do business in Jerusalem during Sabbath, Nehemiah rebuked them. Third point, like Isaiah, Jeremiah also used the metaphor of a porter to teach the people of South Judah. God sent Jeremiah to the house of a porter. Jeremiah watched as the porter molded his clay, made it into a lump, and then molded it again. As the porter molded his clay, God showed Jeremiah that he also molded the countries. This was Isaiah's prayer when he used the metaphor of a porter. Yet to you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the porter. We are all the work of your hands. Later, St. Paul also referred to this. After using the metaphor of the porter to teach the people, Jeremiah once again rebuked them for refusing to repent. When the people heard this, they did not repent, but later tried to kill Jeremiah. Thus, Jeremiah cried out to God and asked him to judge them. Fourth point, through the symbolic act of Jeremiah breaking the clay work, God showed how South Judah was to fall soon. God told Jeremiah to go and buy some clay from a porter and take along some of the elders of the people and the priests to the valley of Ben-Hinnom. God tried to give South Judah a message regarding the Molech idol, and so he called them the place of their idol worship. And there God declared his judgment on South Judah. God told them about the punishment recorded in Leviticus chapter 26 and said that they were to receive it accordingly. Through Jeremiah's performance of breaking the clay, South Judah's punishment became confirmed. After declaring their punishment at the valley of Ben-Hinnom, God declared punishment again in Jerusalem. God had molded Jerusalem with all his efforts, but the people had made it into a dirty place. Because of this, Jerusalem and the houses of the kings and the priests became a place where no one wanted to go to. This was all due to their sins. Fifth point. Priest Pasher of the Jerusalem temple beat Jeremiah. When Jeremiah declared the God's punishment on South Judah, Priest Pasher from the Jerusalem temple beat him and rebuked him. God passed on his message to Pasher through Jeremiah. This was that Pasha and his friends would be taken to Babylon where they will die. God even changed Pasha's name to mean fear on every side. This moreover symbolized that South Judah would become cornered. Jeremiah cried out to God, and his cry was like the cry of Job. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, May the day of my birth perish, and the night that said, A boy is conceived, that day may turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine on it. Day 208, Jeremiah 21-23 Punishment against false prophets. Jeremiah honestly persuaded the people to surrender to Babylon and repent of the evils repeated from the time of their forefathers 
while accepting the 70-year captivity. First point, King Zedekiah requested to Jeremiah to pray for South Judah in hopes that there might be a miracle. As God had delivered South Judah out of the hands of Assyria during the reign of Hezekiah 150 years ago, King Zedekiah hoped for the same result this time round as well. And so, he asked Jeremiah for help. 150 years ago, Hezekiah tore his robes and went into the Jerusalem temple to ask for God's help through Isaiah. God saved South Judah because of this. Now, 150 years later, Zedekiah requested Jeremiah to pray for the same outcome. As the Babylonian invasions began, according to Jeremiah's prophecy, King Zedekiah looked for God's miracle to deliver them from Babylon. But this was not Zedekiah repenting or obeying God, but only seeking immediate help. Zedekiah's cry went against all the times Jeremiah had persuaded him to surrender. Despite this, Jeremiah told Zedekiah God's decision yet again. God's answer to save their life was to surrender to Babylon. If they obeyed, then they would be able to live. Second point, the response God gave to Jeremiah was that Jerusalem would not witness a miracle but God's burning anger. God spoke to South Judah through Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says to you, House of David. Administer justice every morning, rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed, or my wrath will break out and burn like fire, because of the evil you have done, burn with no one to quench it. This was God explaining that the people were being punished for the sins of the South Judah kings. God explained that if they did not surrender and obey, then they would become targets of mockery. As God said, with Zedekiah marking the end, the descendants of David could no longer be kings. The 500 years of monarchy had come to an official end. Third point, God declared that South Judah would no longer be able to continue their monarchy. Joachim died during battle against Babylon. Regarding Joachim's son, Joachim, God told him about his future through Jeremiah. As God declared, Joachim, his wife, the nobles of South Judah, Ezekiel, and 10,000 skilled workers were taken as the second group of captives to Babylon. Although Joachim was released from prison 37 years later and treated well in Babylon thereafter, he was not able to return to Jerusalem. The sons of Joachim were not able to maintain their monarchy, and all came to an end with Zedekiah as the last king. This is what the Lord says, Record this man as if childless, a man who will not prosper in his lifetime, for none of his offspring will prosper. None will sit on the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. Fourth point. God declared the judgment on South Judah and also the coming of the Messiah. God told Jeremiah about the days of restoration for South Judah after their punishment. This was God explaining how a kingdom of priests was to be re-established after the return of the captives. God furthermore told Jeremiah about the birth and coming of the Messiah. The coming of the Messiah was also recorded in Isaiah 11 verse 1. It was also recorded in Micah 5 verse 2. This was prepared 800 years later through Matthew's genealogy of Jesus Christ. It was also fulfilled through the conversation between Jesus and Pontius Pilate. Fifth point, God spoke of his anger against the false prophets. God gave a warning to the false prophets to Jeremiah. The false prophets were instrumental both to the fall of North Israel and South Judah. 
they did not deliver God's words, but later said what they wanted to say. The false prophets taught what was in their foolish hearts. They also spoke of peace to those who rebuked God and did evil. They were not called by God. They told false things through God's name. They also led the people to forget about God. God spoke to false prophets, yes, declares the Lord. I'm against the prophets who wag their own tongues, and yet declare the Lord declares. Indeed, I'm against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies. Yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. God emphasized that he would strike them down. To the people who laughed at God's warning, God told them that he would punish them and that they would see their fall because of their arrogance. Day 209, Jeremiah 24-25 Good Fix Product God, who trained South Judah in Babylon, said that those who were taken captive were the good fig trees. First point, God told Jeremiah of his project to make the people of South Judah into good figs. The people of South Judah were to be taken captive to Babylon due to their sins. But sin in the bigger picture, it was God's project to make them into good figs. Those who were left in South Judah were relieved that they were not taken as captives the first and second rounds. God had sent Daniel and his three friends as the first group, and Ezekiel and the 10,000 skilled workers as the second group, for his project to make them into good figs. In actual fact, those who had already gone were the good fix, and those who were left behind were the bad fix. God had hope to reset a kingdom of priests through these good fix. Second point, those who did not surrender to Babylon, including King Zedekiah, and those who fled to Egypt, would become like bad fix. God explained who the bad fix were to Jeremiah. Those who were bad fix were Zedekiah and the people who resisted surrendering to Babylon, and also those who ran away to Egypt. They were to receive God's severe punishment. Earlier, God had shown Abraham the promised land and then guided the way. The way God showed them now was Babylon. That is why they were not to go to Egypt. There were indeed people who disobeyed God and went to Egypt. They went as far as to drag Jeremiah with them. God told them to live under the rule of Babylon for 70 years as they trained themselves to become good figs. But there are those who disobeyed and attempted to escape their immediate reality. Third point, South Judah did not listen to the past 23 years of Jeremiah's words given by God. The king and leaders of South Judah did not listen to Jeremiah's words, but later did as they pleased. God sent many prophets to South Judah, including Jeremiah, to help them turn from their ways. But they were the ones who refused to listen until the end. Although God tried to turn away from his anger, they behaved so badly that they aroused God's anger all the more. God's reason for punishing them was in order to make them return to him. Fourth point, God declared that he would use his servant, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, to judge all nations. The people of South Judah at the time believed that Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon was much more powerful than God. But God clearly pointed out that Nebuchadnezzar was God's tool to punish his people. 
that furthermore explained that many countries would be taken to Babylon for 70 years as captives. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. As God declared in 586 BC, South Judah collapsed and the remaining people in South Judah were dragged as captives to Babylon. Different to the first and second group of captives, the third group were taken in chains and beaten on the way. Fifth point, God declared that he would punish Babylon after 70 years. God told Jeremiah that Babylon would fall in 70 years. God's words were fulfilled in 539 BC when Babylon fell in the hands of the Persian Empire. With the death of the Babylon king in the hands of the Persian Empire, the Babylonian Empire came to a close. God explained to Jeremiah that Babylon's role was to help God judge South Judah and its surrounding countries. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. God declared the judgment on South Judah, Egypt, Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and other countries. As such, God governs the universe and manages it with righteousness and justice. Day 210 Jeremiah 26-28 Jeremiah's Rope and York Performance Although false prophets preached the message of restoration without a hardship, this was a false prophecy that brought God's judgment. First point, God told Jeremiah to deliver his message inside the Jerusalem temple. The sermon in Jeremiah chapter 26 is the same as the content in Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah's message about the temple can be found in Jeremiah 26 verses 3 to 6. This was Jeremiah rebuking the people for coming to the temple of Jerusalem but not doing as they were told by the rose. Thus, Jeremiah declared that the temple would become like Shiloh. Shiloh was a place where the people of Israel went after conquering Canaan in order to keep their annual festivals. But during the time of priest Eli, the ark was taken from Shiloh. And Shiloh was located in those Israel, which was destroyed. As such, those who did not keep God's words were to fall, just like the previous people who fell for the same reason. The religious leaders and the people showed a different response. The leaders of the temple and the false prophets and some of the people wanted to kill Jeremiah. Here, Jeremiah proclaimed that he was sent by God and that they were to depart. On the other hand, some political leaders believed that Jeremiah was sent by God and claimed that they should save him. A few of the elders came and helped Jeremiah. They tried to prove that Jeremiah was right through the record of Micah in 8th century BC. This was indeed a dangerous situation, and Jeremiah could have died. Before Jeremiah, the prophet Uriah was put to death whilst delivering God's message. As Uriah died, Jeremiah could also have been put to death. Second point, Jeremiah started his performance with the rope and yoke in front of King Zedekiah who hosted the meeting for the alliance between the six countries. When Babylon grew extremely strong, Zedekiah gathered the representatives of five surrounding countries and opened an assembly. God sent Jeremiah to this assembly in Jerusalem. The countries to come were Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon. The objective of this assembly was Babylon and their growing power. 
the chair of this assembly was Zedekiah. Zedekiah gave a talk about how South Judah, 150 years ago during the reign of Hezekiah, managed to ward off the Assyrians, whilst killing 185,000 of the Assyrian army. Zedekiah proposed that the countries come together to create a similar outcome. Zedekiah was in place of his nephew, Jehoiachin, who was taken to Babylon and he was ruling at a time of great turmoil. As Zedekiah had a reputation among the people of South Judah that he was made king by the Babylonians, he had ambitions to change his reputation into a wise and helpful king by learning this international assembly. It was here that Jeremiah came in uninvited with a rope and a yoke. He walked in completely uninvited and started to deliver God's message. Jeremiah first showed the rope and explained that God's measurements had already finished and so they would be taken to Babylon. Second, he showed the yoke and persuaded them to suffer the wooden yoke rather than the iron yoke. The people who attended this meeting were to go and deliver God's message to their countries. This was a warning that Nebuchadnezzar would burden all of them with yokes. Jeremiah's message made everyone feel completely uncomfortable. Because of him, the assembly was put to a cross and Zedekiah's leadership also dissipated. Third point. Jeremiah told Zedekiah to surrender to Babylon and to not listen to the words of the false prophets. Jeremiah put his life on the line and delivered God's message to Zedekiah. He told him to surrender to Babylon and serve the Babylonian king. He also told him not to believe the words of the false prophets. Jeremiah went on to tell the priests and the people about God's message. The message was to not listen to the false prophets and also to serve Babylon. Also, the Jerusalem temple would be destroyed, but it would be restored again. All the items of the Jerusalem temple would be taken to Babylon. Nothing would remain, but everything would be returned. Fourth point, Zedekiah raised the false prophet Hananiah as the keynote speaker during the international gathering. After Jeremiah's love and York performance, the assembly came to an end, and each of the representatives from the five countries returned to their homes. However, Zedekiah opened another event for the people of South Judah. The spokesperson Zedekiah called was Hananiah. The location was the Jerusalem temple. The time was the fourth year of Zedekiah's reign and the guests were the priests and the older people of South Judah. The theme of this assembly was that Zedekiah broke the yoke of the Babylonian king. At the time, Babylon had taken the first and second group of captives from South Judah, and the remaining people were living in fear. Amid such circumstances, Zedekiah called Hananiah to deliver God's message. The people were overjoyed when they heard Hananiah's message, but Jeremiah publicly proclaimed that Hananiah was a false prophet. Jeremiah furthermore explained the identity of a real prophet sent by God. Zedekiah was very angry at the words of Jeremiah and started to attack him with the people. Hananiah took Jeremiah's wooden yoke to show that they could break the yoke of Babylon. But they did not realize that if they did not carry the wooden yoke, they would have to suffer the iron yoke. Pips point to Hananiah, who declared that their captivity in Babylon would be two years, Jeremiah told him that he would die in that year. Regarding the false prophets of South Judah, including Hananiah, God said the following. The first was that they would have to suffer the iron yoke, and that South Judah would most certainly fall in the hands of Babylon. The second 
was that Hananiah was to be severely punished by God. Hananiah died two months after God spoke these words. Despite Hananiah's death, the people of South Judah still did not turn to God. Day 211, Jeremiah 29-31 to The New Covenant, the bridge between the Old and New Testament. Jeremiah sent a letter to the people taken to Babylon, saying that the captivity period was 70 years and that this was God's will. First point. Jeremiah wrote a letter to the captives of South Judah who were taken to Babylon. Jeremiah sent letters to those who were taken as captives to Babylon the first and second lounge. Those who were taken in the second group were living in Babylon and working for them, and so Jeremiah sent a heartfelt letter. He explained that they were to live in Babylon for 70 years, and that this was God's project for them to grow into good figs in a kingdom of priests. He also told them to pray for Babylon and its peace during those 70 years. During battles, it was normal for captives and slaves to be put in front as meat shields. If Babylon had to go to war, the captives would be the first to die. Therefore, Jeremiah told them to pray for the peace of Babylon for 70 years. He also told them not to be fooled by false prophets. They were reminded that they would be able to return to Jerusalem once the 70 years came to an end. Daniel received this letter and therefore prayed, whilst knowing that Babylon would perish in 70 years. The captives were told to pray to God during their years in Babylon. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Second point, God told Jeremiah of his judgment of the false prophets, Ahab, Zedekiah, and Shimei. To Koliah's son Ahab and Maaseah's son Zedekiah, who told false messages about God to the people, God declared judgment. Those who spoke false words about God were to die a brutal death and this would be used to illustrate an undignified death. Shumeya, a false prophet during the time of Babylon captivity, strongly accused Jeremiah of having said that their stay in Babylon would last 70 years, and sent a letter to Jephaniah, the governor in Jerusalem, to punish Jeremiah. The contents of the letter sent to Jephaniah in the Jerusalem temple during the time of Babylon captivity by Shimeiah can be found in Jeremiah 29 verses 26 to 28. Shimeiah did not repent and sent a letter to make Jeremiah stop sending letters to Jerusalem. God punished Shimeiah. Third point, God explained that the captives would be able to return from Babylon after 70 years. God explained how the people of South Judah would be restored. God wanted Jeremiah to write this down and make a record. Although the people had no desire to listen or read about this now, God wanted the people to have this record to refer to later on. To the people of South Judah, God promised that when their punishment was over, He would deliver them from their enemies' hands and heal their wounds. He would also enable the Jerusalem temple to be restored. He would also grant them peace. Lastly, He promised them their leader. As such, after 70 years, the relationship between God and South Judah would be restored again. So you will be my people and I will be your God. First point, God told Jeremiah of the perfect restoration of those Israel and South Judah that would come. God gave a message regarding the restoration of North Israel. This was God's promise that he would restore the 12 tribes of Israel and enable them to worship God again in the restored Jerusalem temple. The reason for God's restoration was because they were chosen by God 
to live as a holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. And God had spoken through the prophet Hosea that God had mercy in his heart. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zevoi? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. God also planned to restore South Judah. After the 70 years were over, the people would be able to live in peace in Jerusalem. The hope declared by Jeremiah was completely different to the hope declared by the false prophet. Jeremiah's declared hope was to happen in the future, and this was God's gift to them. Although their reality was painful, they were to persevere in order to experience God's blessing, peace, and restoration. Fifth point, Jeremiah prophesied the new covenant, which was the most important bridge that connected to the New Testament. God told Jeremiah of the new covenant. This new covenant was important because it connected the Old and New Testaments. The writer of Hebrews also wrote about the new covenant. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. Then what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. The process leading up to this new covenant was as follows. First, it began with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through God's grace covenant. Second, upon the foundation of this grace covenant, God made a bilateral covenant with the people of Israel after Exodus in Mount Sinai. The bilateral covenant was a promise between God and the people of Israel and a vow that they would keep God's laws. Third, after 900 years, God told Jeremiah about the new covenant. 600 years from then, Jesus Christ came to this earth and also spoke of this new covenant. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This new covenant became fulfilled through the cross of Jesus Christ. Day 212, Jeremiah 32 to 33, Grand and Detailed. Although South Judah was under the oppression of Babylon for now, God promised Israel's restoration through Jeremiah. First point, King Zedekiah locked Jeremiah up in prison for the words he said. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. In the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, the army of the king of Babylon was then besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was confined in the courtyard of the guard in the royal palace of Judah. The reason Jeremiah was locked up can be found in Jeremiah 32 verses 3-5. At the time, the Jerusalem walls were being seized by Babylon, but when the Babylonian army went to fight with Egypt for a short while, Zedekiah and his officials believed that Babylon had moved away from South Judah. When Jeremiah continued to claim that South Judah would fall in the hands of Babylon, Zedekiah locked him up. Second point. God made Jeremiah purchase some land in Anathoth, his hometown. When Jeremiah was locked up, God came to him and told him to purchase some land in his hometown, Anathoth. The reason Jeremiah was told to purchase land was according to the laws in a kingdom of priests regarding the rights of land ownership. God's reason was, for this is what the Lord Almighty the God of Israel says, How this, Feldes and Binyadis will again be bought in this land. God was showing that when the captivity ended, the cultivation rights of the land of South Judah would be bought and sold again. 
This was God strongly showing that the people would be able to return and that he would restore a kingdom of priests. Third point, Jeremiah prayed for the day South Judah became restored. Jeremiah prayed to God after buying the land in Anathoth, his hometown. God told Jeremiah that South Judah's fall had already been decided. The reason for their fall was idol worship and because they did not follow in God's teachings. Despite this, God still promised their restoration. God showed that he would restore them by commanding Jeremiah to purchase land and also through the promise of the restoration of the people 70 years later. The reason God told the people to surrender to Babylon was in order to save them. If they obeyed and endured, God would restore them in his time. Fourth point, the two points God declared were the return of the captives and also the coming of the Messiah. God told Jeremiah two big and intricate prophecies. These were the return and restoration of the captives, and the second was the coming of the Messiah. Jerusalem, the center of religion and politics, faced destruction, but Jeremiah prophesied its full restoration. The more Babylon attacked, God's words came stronger, and God had already planned, through Ezekiel, the vision of the restoration of the Jerusalem temple. God furthermore explained the reason why South Judah had to fall. God told Jeremiah whilst he was locked up of the fall and the restoration of South Judah. This was God's plan to reset a kingdom of priests. The bigger picture was that God would send the Messiah to restore all nations in the everlasting kingdom. Fifth point, the ultimate conclusion for God's restoration of South Judah was Messiah's kingdom. God told Jeremiah about the coming of the Messiah's kingdom. The Messiah would come as the descendant of David. Jesus Christ would come to save the people and to bring peace and righteousness. And this was God's hope towards Jerusalem also. Even to those who were taken to Babylon as captives and did not believe in restoration, God gave them the message of hope in Jeremiah chapter 33.